Good morning, everyone. The webinar will begin in about five minutes. Uh, while waiting, I do encourage you to download the handout that's available under the handouts tab on the control panel. It summarizes today's presentation. While we wait for the webinar to begin, we do have Dr. Tina Bargava with us. Good morning, Tina. Good morning, Patrick. Uh, before we start, uh, mental bandwidth is somewhat of a new concept, at least to me. What got you started studying mental bandwidth? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, so I was working in Pittsburgh with the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center at their Center for Research on Healthcare. And we were doing a project with the Department of Defense and the Air Force um, looking at ways to help to prevent diabetes. Um, and we were doing an online program to help people change their lifestyle, like track their foods and do physical activity and think about their overall healthy behaviors. Um, and my job as the coordinator of the project was to call the participants when they stopped doing the stuff and ask them, you know, how are you doing? What's going on? Is there anything I can do to get you going again with the program or to help you um, figure it out? And, you know, as you know, most of the people weren't, they didn't say like, oh, I'm just not interested or I don't want to do it anymore. They're mostly saying things like, I have so many other things going on in my life. I just can't like find the, the capacity to do the things you want me to do, like to count my calories and write everything down or, or, you know, like I have caregiving responsibilities and it's really stressful for me to try and change these other things while I'm also trying to, you know, attend to my mom who has Alzheimer's or my kids who are in all these activities. Um, and so I started thinking about like, what does it take for your brain to change your lifestyle? Like, how do you actually, you know, change what you eat or start being physically active? Do those things, what does it take for your brain to do that? And so I delved into the field of neuropsychology and started to understand like this concept of mental bandwidth. Like we only have so much brain capacity. You know, it's not unlimited. And when we ask people to change their health behaviors, you know, public health is my area. When we ask people to change their health behaviors, we're asking them to do hard things. Um, and it's actually high brain demands. And I could understand why some of the people in the program wanted to engage in those behaviors, but were really struggling because of the other brain demands that they had. And the things that we were asking them to do weren't easy. So I thought about like when somebody has diabetes or when they're told that they're at risk for diabetes, they have this thing called the AADE7, the American Association of Diabetes Educators, seven behaviors for, for successfully managing your diabetes. And it's like, eat healthy and exercise and check your blood sugar and take your medication and reduce stress and increase your problem solving skills and don't smoke or drink. It's like all these hard things to do. You know, they give you this little brochure like here's these seven things to do, just do these and you'll be fine. And I'm like, each one of these is a hard brain task. Um, and so that was really what got me into bandwidth was thinking about how, what are tasks? How much demand do they make on our brain? How much capacity do we have? Can we do everything we wanna do? Um, and so that's really what got me into it. Okay, well, good. Um, you know, it's been really hot and muggy lately. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like the heat just wears you down. Does heat affect your mental bandwidth? Actually, yeah, because your brain is part of your body. Um, and so when your body is under stress, your brain is under stress. Um, and so things you might normally have bandwidth for, if your body's feeling the stress of that. Now, if you're inside in your cozy air conditioned house, then no, probably the heat's not affecting you too much. But if you've got to be out there or um, if you don't have such great air conditioning, when I lived in California, nobody had air conditioning because they just, in Northern California, it's just so beautiful all the time. They don't really need air conditioning. Um, and so I remember thinking like that would definitely drain some of my bandwidth to have to deal with that extra burden of the heat on your body. Exactly. Okay, well, we are right at 11 o'clock according to my clock. So okay. good morning. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. Increasing Employee Engagement, a Mental Bandwidth Perspective. My, my name is Patrick okay. Allen. I'm the Program Manager for Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development's Public Open Enrollment Programs. 
Our center specializes in providing employee development for partnering organizations in Northeast Ohio and around the world. We offer training as both public open enrollment programs that are currently being delivered both live and virtually via Zoom, and but we also have started some in-person programs again, and we hold those at the Educational Service Center in, in Independence. Now, we can also customize any program and deliver it live and virtual or in person at your location. I am joined today by Kent State Facilitator Tina Bargava. I will be serving as your host and Tina will be our presenter. Tina is a faculty member in the Kent State College of Public Health. She completed her bachelor's in human biology and a master's in education at Stanford University. And she completed a doctorate in public health at the University of Pittsburgh. She is one of the top research in the topic of mental bandwidth, and we are excited to bring her programs Mental Bandwidth Basics and Mental Bandwidth for Team Leaders for Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development beginning next fall. Everyone in attendance today has been muted to avoid background noise from the nearly 100 registered participants. We also encourage you to ask questions at any point during the hour. You can submit your questions to me using the questions tab on the control panel. I will present your questions to Tina as time permits throughout the webinar. Again, there is a handout available to you that summarizes today's presentation, and it's located under the handouts tab on the control panel. We encourage you to download it and take notes during today's presentation. We are recording today's webinar, and you will receive an email next week with a link to the recording after we conclude our time together. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Tina Bargava. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, so um, thank you all for attending today. It's so great to have you with us. Um, I'm gonna be giving just a brief summary of some of the mental bandwidth concepts um, to get us started. And then I'm gonna give you some strategies um, and tips for thinking about mental bandwidth in the workplace and especially in terms of employee engagement. So let's start with what is mental bandwidth. Um, so mental bandwidth um, is in regards to your brain processing amount. So if you think about it big picture, um, the human brain processes about 11 million bits per second of information. And that might be a little, you might be like bits per second, what is that? Um, how much information is that, right? Well, to give you a comparison, one second of television is 9 billion bits per second, okay? so. The human brain can process about 11 million bits per second. One second of television throws out about 9 billion bits of information. So we do a lot with our brains, but there's a lot of information out there. So if you think about it, um, if your brain can process 11 million bits per second, how much of that do you think that you have conscious control over? So Patrick is gonna put up a poll. Um, and what I want to ask is, of our 11 million bits per second, how much do you have conscious control over? Is it like 50%, so half of your brain processing that you get control over? Is it more like 20%? Um, is it 10%? Is it more like 2%? Or is it even less than 2%? That would be tough, right? So what do you guys think? The poll should be open. Love to yep. see what do you, what do you guys think? Yep, it's open right now, so we'll give them uh, a little bit of time here to vote. Okay, just a few more seconds, and I'm going to close it. Okay, let's see what you guys think. So it looks at like at 31% less than 2%. Okay. 27% say 10%. Okay. And then tied at 15% are both 20% uh, and 2%. And then in last at 12% is the 50%. Okay. Yeah, so you're right. We definitely don't have 50% of our brain processing power free to us. Um, we actually have about 0.1%. So those of you who guessed less than 2% were correct. So we only have about 100 bits per second of brain processing 
under our conscious control. So our brain does like a whole lot of things automatically. And that's great because you think about like, well, if somebody throws something at you, you want to be able to duck and, you know, you want your legs to move automatically. You don't want to have to think about it when you're walking, right? So there's a lot of things we want our brains to do automatically and that's great. But that also means that we just have this tiny little bit, this hundred bits per second that's under our conscious control. That's about a sh short sentence. A hundred bits per second is about a short sentence per second. So that may resonate with some of you in thinking about how much control, consciously controlled thought do you have? Um, it's really interesting. We all have about the same capacity, that 100 bits per second. That's pretty much the same. There's some variation between people, but it's not as much as you would think. So um, the big variation comes in how much of that is available to us, right? So we have the capacity, um, but it varies widely how much of that is available. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, some of the things that can take up our bandwidth, because even though we have conscious control over our mental bandwidth, there are things that can, against our wishes, steal our bandwidth from us. So bandwidth drains that I wanted to talk about. Um, these can vary widely. If you think about it, especially in terms of the workplace, um, having a lot of information, so information overload, right? Our brains weren't really designed for the amount of information that we generate in the world now. Right, like I told you, it's 9 billion bits of information from one second of television, right? Your brain has to take that and decide which parts to focus on and what to do. Um, and so there's a lot of information. And the more information we expose ourselves to, the more it can drain our bandwidth, trying to sort out what to pay attention to. Um, there, any kind of uncertainty. Um, so if you have uncertainty and expectations, like what am I supposed to do? or what does my work week look like? You can think about all the uncertainty from the pandemic really um, caused our brains to use a lot of mental bandwidth trying to resolve the uncertainty. Our brains are there to protect us and they don't like it when um, we don't know what's gonna happen next, right? So we like trying to make things certain. Our brain will try and make things certain even when things aren't certain. So things of unclear expectations or uncertainties about what should happen and next or how things are going to look in a month, those kinds of things can be very draining for our bandwidth. Um, inclusion is, this is how we see the power of inclusion in the workplace. When people don't feel like they belong or that they're not welcome in a certain space, um, that can also trigger worries, doubts, um, and issues that drain their bandwidth. So it actually makes it harder for them to be able to do the things that they're trying to do if they feel like they don't belong in that space. Um, financial insecurity, mental and physical health issues, um, chronic stress are all things that also take away from bandwidth. So that small short sentence of bandwidth that we start with, that 100 bits per second, can actually be um, drained um, pretty quickly through some of these other things. And the more that we're exposed to of these things, the more likely we're have using less, or we have access to less of our bandwidth than we want. Um, so here's a question for you guys. So if we can do, Patrick, if we can throw up the second poll, um, which demands more mental bandwidth? What do you think? Creating a new habit or breaking an old habit? So which demands more mental bandwidth, creating a new habit or breaking an old habit? To make it simpler, we'll say the same habit. We're talking about the same habit. Is it starting it fresh or having something that you're breaking? Which one would be more bandwidth demanding? Okay, it is open. We'll give them a few more seconds because I can see the votes are still coming in. Okay. Okay, about two more seconds and I'm going to close it. And overwhelming response of 91% say breaking an old habit, 9% say creating overwhelmingly them. correct. <laughs> yeah, so it is really hard on your brain. So when we're talking about bandwidth, you're talking about your brain, right? And we're talking about neural pathways. That's how we do things. We have different pathways in our brain that help us to do certain behaviors. So when you're creating a new habit, you're creating a new neural pathway. Um, and if you do something over and over again consistently, it kind of etches that neural pathway into your brain 
so that you start to do that without thinking, right? It moves it from your bandwidth to your automatic part of your brain. That's what we're doing is creating neural pathways to do that. So creating a new habit is hard. It can take time, but if you're creating it from scratch, right? It's just trying to etch that new neural pathway. And if you do it consistently and frequently, then that's what you can do. You can build that habit. Breaking an old habit is much harder and you probably have life experience that tells you this, right? Um, we are, once our neural pathways kind of get etched, then that's where our brains are likely to go automatically. So unless we use our bandwidth to override our automatic um, impulse, then our brains are gonna do the automatic thing that we've etched into our neural pathways. And so when you already have the habit of doing something, then your brain's gonna go there automatically and you have to use your bandwidth to number one, not do that thing. And number two, choose to do something else and if you're trying to create a new habit while you're breaking an old habit, then you also have to be etching that new neural pathway. So that's a really high demand situation, right? So breaking that old habit, those old neural pathways is really um, difficult. Um, so good job on that one. Bandwidth, as you probably can tell by now, is extremely important. So bandwidth helps us to make good decisions, um, to take in all the gray area and have good judgment to take actions that are complicated or unfamiliar, that's where we use our bandwidth, right? So again, you've got all that automatic processing, the 99.9% .9 of your brain that's going on automatically. Um, this also helps us to make those good decisions, our mental bandwidth. It helps us also to learn new things, to be productive, to complete tasks that aren't automatic for us, that take our thought, um, to be innovative and creative. That's, Innovation and creativity are like building new neural pathways, connecting things that weren't connected before. Has anybody heard? There's a new trend of bro nuts. These are brownies and donuts. Um, like it's a brownie in the shape of a donut. Okay, well, putting two things together that aren't usually together takes a new neural pathway. So we need bandwidth to come up with those kinds of creative ideas. Um, having patience um, with other people or controlling your impulses. Um, so if there's some particular pet peeve you have that really irritates you, right, and when that happens, not, not yelling at a person or not getting upset is controlling an impulse, and we need our bandwidth to control those impulses. So bandwidth is extremely important. The thing is that when we don't have enough bandwidth for everything that we're trying to do, we experience what I call bandwidth exhaustion. So we try and do some tasks, like you think about at work, like you have this list of things to do today and you try and do them and you're having a hard time, you're having a hard time focusing or getting things done or you keep having distractions. And so you don't get things done that you're expecting to get done or your employees don't get things done that you're expecting them to complete. Um, as you kind of experience that series of small failures, you also experience some invalidation, like. I should be able to do this. Why can't I get this done? These are the things on my list. I'm supposed to do them and I'm not checking them off as fast as I'd like to. Um, and so that those series of small failures can trigger a sense of threat in your brain. So when your brain feels like you're not doing a good enough job, it can trigger a threat response. And our brains can th feel threatened whether we're actually threatened or not. Like whether there's a physical danger or not, if our brain thinks we're threatened, it's going to kick us into threat mode. It's going to kick in that stress response, that fight, flight, or freeze. I'm sure you guys have heard of that before, right? That once you get into that stress mode, you experience all those different things because your brain thinks that there's danger. And your brain can think that there's danger from having these series of things that you're not accomplishing the way that you'd want to have them. The problem is when people move into bandwidth exhaustion, those fight, flight, and freeze responses are not what we want to see in the workplace. So the freezing can be um, a lot of different formats. So what I think of is like picking up your phone and scrolling social media, right? Like th it's just a way to kind of like hit the pause button on the things you're trying to use your bandwidth for. And most social media doesn't take a lot of bandwidth. Um, like it doesn't take a lot of conscious bandwidth. It's a bandwidth drain, unfortunately. It can use up your bandwidth, but it's not that you have to do it intentionally. It kind of does it to you. Um, so that would be a freeze. Um, a flight might be like avoiding certain tasks. Are there certain things that um, you just kind of keep putting off or they keep moving from your list from one day to the next? That's kind of a sign of 
bandwidth exhaustion. And the more bandwidth exhausted you are, the more likely you are to put off tasks. Um, and then fight can come across in several ways. It can be really like um, attending to perfectionism, like trying to get everything exactly right. That's your brain trying to fight for more certainty that you think like, if I can put everything in the right place and everything can happen just the way I want, then everything will be okay, right? That's the message that your brain is giving you. And that can also be triggered from that stress response. Or it can be anger and judgment, lashing out other people, blaming them for situations. Those things can also contribute to um, your, um, come from your stress response, okay? So bandwidth exhaustion is not what we wanna see. We see it a lot, especially now after the pandemic with all the uncertainty, people are already bandwidth exhausted. And then you add in additional demands or new expectations. Um, and then we end up with a lot of bandwidth exhausted people. So I wanna pause there for a moment and see if there are any questions um, before we get into some strategies. Yeah, we did have a couple come in. Um, do some people have more bandwidth than others? So not really. Um, you know, like, yes, there are, are differences, but as human beings, we mostly have the same amount. Like the way our brain works, it's pretty much that some people say 120 bits per second is what we have. Um, other people say more like 100. Um, it really kind of depends. But for the most part, um, Neurodivergent people may have a little bit different variation of how their bandwidth is accessed, but it's not so much different in terms of the amount of bandwidth. Okay, this one kind of follows up to that. Or if we all have the same bandwidth capacity, why would we have different amounts of bandwidth available? So we have that stuff there, but we, we each face different drains. Right. So there are different things that might be pulling from my bandwidth than yours. Like, for example, my mom has been in and now the hospital for a few weeks and that's that takes up my bandwidth. I'm thinking about that. I'm worrying about her. I'm making sure that she's OK. Um, that would affect my bandwidth availability. And somebody else might have other challenges that are affecting their bandwidth availability. And so different kinds of people might have more or less sense of belonging in a workplace or in a social situation um, that would make their bandwidth vary um, in terms of availability. Okay, that's all we have for now. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we're gonna go into some strategies. What can we do about this? These are just touching the surface. Um, there's a lot to these. So those um, programs in the fall what we really delve into this and get into specific strategies, but I wanted to at least touch on some basic ideas. So the first strategy is to streamline bandwidth demands. So by that, I mean, if we can recognize the things that have very high bandwidth demands that like take a lot of your bandwidth and we can reduce the amount of bandwidth it takes to still have the successful completion of that task, then that's how we're really gonna be able to be successful. So even if people's bandwidth is limited, they can still get their tasks accomplished, right? So um, thinking about kind of how do we set up patterns and procedures so that our it's easier for our brain to do things. So one of the things I would suggest for individuals, right, is to think about what's your good time of your day for your brain, right? For me, it's first thing in the morning. Like when I wake up in the morning, I'm pretty much ready to go. My mind is active. My thoughts are clear. I don't have all these worries yet on my plate. Um, things haven't distracted me. So for me, the beginning of the day is the best time for me to do high bandwidth demand tasks. And I'm not going to go into a, how do we determine a high bandwidth versus a low bandwidth demand task into detail, but things that are more complicated, or things that you have more resistance to doing that you don't enjoy, those things can be higher bandwidth demands. I would wanna put those tasks at the beginning of the day. So you don't wanna start with your fresh bandwidth with the low bandwidth demand tasks because then it's gonna be harder to do the high bandwidth ones later. Um, another thing would be to create cues in your environment for what you need to do. So this might be um, little reminder notes, um, getting things written, putting notes on your calendar to um, remind you to do certain things at certain times so you don't have to use your bandwidth to recall the next thing to do. 
um, in terms of if you're a team leader or if you um, have some control over the work environment, you can actually create bigger patterns that help people to do things with less bandwidth. So a great example is the shadow board strategy that's talked about in Lean Six Sigma. Um, so for example, if you're in a, in a field where people use a lot of different tools um, that you have, like maybe you have outlines of where the tools go um, in the workspace so that as they are doing their work, they know where each tool is and they are able to put it back, right? So there's an actual picture of a hammer or um, of a you know microscope or something. There's a tape outline of that on the counter so that people put things back and get things from the place that they know that it's there. So they don't have to think about that piece. You try and automatize it for them. This can also work really well with um, um, thinking about how to get people to do the next action. Like for example, if you want people to use hand sanitizer, putting a hand sanitizer dispenser when they come in the door is actually a super effective way to get them to use it. They don't have to think about doing it. They see it, they use it, right? Um, and so those are some of the ways to streamline bandwidth demands. Um, the second strategy I'm gonna talk about is um, to automatize difficult tasks. So automatize is probably a word you haven't heard a lot. It actually is used in the neuropsychology literature. But the idea is to take the stuff from using up your mental bandwidth and move it into that automatic part of your brain processing, right? So can we automatize something, make it automatic so it's not taking up so much of our bandwidth? And we can actually do this with difficult tasks as long as they're consistent. So a good example of a difficult task that we automatize is reading, right? So reading is actually a really challenging thing to learn and to do. Um, you have to put all those letters together and words together into meaning and then take the meaning out of it. Once we've learned how to read and once we've mastered that skill, we do that part automatically and we save our bandwidth for understanding the content of what we're reading, right? So we can do difficult things automatically. How do we get there though is what I wanted to talk about, right? So you wanna utilize a stepwise approach and consistent processes for complex tasks, right? So if you have something that's a more complex task that maybe not everyone's doing the same or to the same quality, um, or if you have something in your job that you find always is a high burden for you, but it's something that you do fairly often, some of the good things that you can do are to develop a consistent procedure for doing it, like a standard operating procedure, right? Like, how do I do this task? And you break it down into steps um, so that you can, um, you know, have a checklist, for example, of how do I do this task, right? The second piece of that would be, okay, so here are the steps for doing this task. Can you practice those steps over and over? Remember I talked about building a neural pathway, right? So if you build a neural pathway for, for a particular task, you are automatizing it, right? So if you do something consistently over and over again, um, a lot of people talk about like, how long does it take to build a new neural pathway? You've probably heard about how long it takes to build a habit. And usually when I ask people that, they're like, you know, anywhere from two weeks to three months is what they've been told it takes to build a habit. Well, to build a new neural pathway is anywhere from three to six months, right? Now, if you do something more frequently, then you can get it down faster. And if you do it consistently, then you can get it even faster. And the last tip, if you do it in a fun way, like a game or something playful or to music or something like that, you can do it even faster, right? So this is how you can etch those neural pathways into your brain. That's what we're really looking for here is to automatize those difficult tasks. If you're a team leader or a supervisor, then you might think about providing people with a standard operating procedure and a checklist and then getting feedback from them on which parts of the process are not going smoothly. That would give you a sign that maybe one of the steps is a higher bandwidth step than it needs to be, right? Um, and so, and rewarding people for doing things in that consistent way would be a way to help to automatize these difficult tasks. Okay, so the first strategy was to streamline bandwidth demands. The second one is to automatize difficult tasks. And then I wanted to give you one bonus tip um, for, um, 
thinking about bandwidth, um, especially for your on an individual level, but um, if you're supervising as well, um, recognize the mind-body connection, right? So your brain is part of your body. Um, sometimes I think we feel like, well, our thoughts are not connected to what's going on in our body, um, but they are. Like, so your bandwidth availability is impacted by the health of your brain on a moment to moment basis. So if at this moment, your body is not in good shape, like you're sick or sleep deprived or, um, you know, any, any kinds of nutritionally deprived, um, you're tired, those kinds of things can, can, can take away from your bandwidth availability. Your brain actually just doesn't have as much bandwidth to make available for you. Um, and so it's really important to recognize that mind-body connection. So what do I suggest then? Um, the, there's a couple of things. I always say eat, sleep, breathe, move, right? Essential functions for your body. You need to eat nutritious foods, not just anything, but things that have nutrition in them, um, like vitamins and minerals. You need to sleep. Your brain does a lot of its work while you're sleeping. Um, if you don't get enough sleep, it doesn't give your brain the chance to do that work. And it, it deprives you of the efficiency that your brain could achieve. So sleep is really important. Breathe means get out in the fresh air, get oxygen. Your brain needs to be oxygenated. Um, and so, and water, that's the other way of breathing, right? Is getting oxygen through the water into your body. And then move because your blood circulation in your body is something that's gonna help to get the blood to your brain, right? Your brain is at the top of your body. So you need to move your body to get the blood circulating all over your body. So when you feel like your bandwidth isn't as good moving, even just a little bit, even just going for a short walk can help to get your bandwidth going again. Um, the other tip I would say is to engage in activities that, that refresh your bandwidth. And this is different for everyone. Um, personally, I decorate cookies. Um, it's a creative process that has good smells that I enjoy. And when I do it, I feel refreshed afterwards, right? So you wanna think of something that makes you feel refreshed. Maybe it's going for a walk. Maybe it's sitting outside in the sunshine when there's sunshine. Um, maybe it's talking to a friend. Maybe it's uh, you know a particular piece of music or something that you enjoy that when you're, when you've completed that activity, you feel like, okay, I can do the next thing now, right? That's what you wanna do is make time for those refreshing activities, not the like ones that just freeze time, not just like scrolling on social media um, or those kinds of things that kind of are at pause, but something that really refreshes is what you wanna look for. Um, and team leaders, you can think about creating conditions that allow people to, um, you know, optimize their mind-body connection. So how are you structuring your lunch breaks? Are there opportunities or spaces that people can go to really refresh themselves? Are you providing like a meditation space or are you providing an outdoor seating where people can go and take a little break and refresh their bandwidth? Um, are you providing healthy snacks for people um, to help them fuel them through the rest of the day for their brain to get the energy that it needs for them to be productive and creative. Um, so are you firm about your off hours, like so that you don't contact them in off hours so that they are getting the, the nutrition and the sleep and the activity that they need to be healthy bodies so that they can come and show up in their full um, productivity. So that's the secret tip, get that mind-body connection in there. I think we're at about time. Is that right, Patrick? I think, I think I've covered everything. And so I would love to take questions now. Yeah, we have had uh, a bunch come in. So Great. Uh, first one, how do I get more mental bandwidth? How do you get more? So it's tricky. We don't really get more. Like we have what we have capacity-wise. Availability-wise, the things I was just talking about are so important. So maintaining a good physical and mental health. So that might be your, you know, your regular preventive care, the eat, sleep, breathe, move, but also like making sure your mental health is attended to, whether that's through a spiritual advisor or a counselor or some friends that you talk to, um, those things all can help to increase the availability of the bandwidth that we have. Okay, good. 
Um, how do I figure out which tasks are high, high bandwidth? Yeah, so sometimes you can tell, right? You can tell when something is making your brain be really high bandwidth, but um, things that are inconsistent um, are usually high bandwidth. So um, if something changes every time that you do it, that's probably going to be a high bandwidth demand because you have to pay attention to it. So I think of it kind of like um, like when you drive to some place that you know, um, like if I drive to my mom's house, like my car kind of goes automatically. I don't even have to really think about it. I know how to get there. But if I'm driving to some place I've never been before and I'm paying attention to each street name, you know, it takes a lot more of my focus and attention. Um, and so it's much more likely that that's going to be a high bandwidth demand. So you can kind of translate that into the workplace. It's different for each workplace, but definitely something we would go into more in the um, the programs, the mental bandwidth basic, basics and the one for team leaders. How do we avoid mental plasticity as tedious day, daily work continues to eat up more and more of our time and mental bandwidth? Yeah, so it's really tricky. So mental plasticity, brain plasticity is actually a good thing. We want, want brain plasticity. And that means that your brain is able to adapt to a lot of different situations. So that's something that we want to be able to have and is important to, for us to be able to have. Um, in terms of that kind of daily tedious work, so if we want to save the bandwidth, it's that automatizing that's really important. So if you can shift more things out of your bandwidth, I think this was one of the hardest parts of the pandemic was that we lost a lot of our routines. Things that we did automatically, we couldn't do automatically anymore. It took thought and it took planning to, you know, get groceries was a big task or even to like make breakfast or get to work or get your kids to school or whatever you're doing um, ended up taking a lot more bandwidth because it wasn't what we had routinely been doing. And so everything kind of, we lost a whole lot of our automatic behaviors and replaced them with high bandwidth demand behaviors. So I think one of the things we can do is automatize. We can streamline, think about how can we make something be less of a bandwidth demand than it is. And um, I have a lot of whole sets of strategies on streamlining bandwidth demands um, so that we're not spending our bandwidth unnecessarily. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then really trying to take care of our brains and our bodies so that our bandwidth is, is at its max without refreshing our bandwidth that we can actually get all of that capacity out of it. Okay. How do we manage time effectively in order to have time to recharge our own batteries? Okay, so how do we manage time? Yeah, so yeah, time management is one thing and bandwidth management is another. Um, they have some similarities. I think it's interesting. I, I always feel frustrated when I have time and I don't have bandwidth. Right, so I'm there and I got time to do something, but my brain is exhausted. Um, so I think part of that is recognizing, learning what our brand with refreshers are and being sure that we engage in them regularly, that we build a habit, a neural pathway for doing the things that refresh our bandwidth so that we're not always showing up to everything with an empty tank, um, an empty mental tank. Um, and so I think one of the important things is planning in breaks, and that can be breaks for refreshing your bandwidth, but also breaks for your body, right? So are we taking the time to eat the nourishing foods, get the water and the oxygen, move our bodies? Those things are really important for our brain being able to function fully. Um, so planning in the breaks, it's one of those things where you kind of have to invest that time into things that will preserve your bandwidth so that you have both time and bandwidth when you have tasks to do. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> what, if any, <clears throat> medically validated self-assessments are available to measure changes to our me mental bandwidth over time? Excellent question. Okay, so validated self-assessments are pretty non-existent for mental bandwidth. Um, mental bandwidth is a moment-to-moment -moment phenomenon, so it's not something that we can easily measure. Um, there are tests, and the Stroop task 
um, is one that's been used traditionally. It's often considered like one of the high standard tests that we use, but it's a cognitive response time test. So you have to have um, someone administer it. You can't administer it to yourself. There's like an online version, but an online version has its own inherent difficulties. Um, I think what we can do is identify what the risk factors are and we can, the research that we do looks at what are the types of things that drain people's bandwidth. So it's more of a kind of, um, for example, there's an experiment that was done where they asked people to wait in a room um, and they're research participants, right? So they wait in a room and then after they wait in the room, they're trying to complete a puzzle. And they tell them that the study is to see what different strategies they use to complete the puzzle. Well, some of the participants are put in a room with a plate of radishes on the table, um, and they're told not to eat the radishes and that the radishes need to stay there um, and they before they do their puzzle, right? The other group of participants is put into a room with a plate of freshly baked cookies that smell really good and told not to eat the cookies. Um, and then they have to go and do their puzzle. So if you compare the radish people with the cookie people, the cookie people, the puzzle is actually unsolvable and the cookie people give up a lot faster than the radish people. Um, so these are the kinds of tests that they do to look at the kinds of things like how much bandwidth capacity do we have available. Um, this would be a test that we're doing to use it as a proxy for how much mental bandwidth do we have available um, to control impulse, um, it takes mental bandwidth. And so when you've restricted people from doing something that they would prefer to do, then their bandwidth is gonna be more strained. Um, so there are a lot of psychological cognitive response time tests that can measure bandwidth in the moment to moment. And I think we're working on developing more kind of questionnaires that can help to assess at any particular time what our risk factors are for bandwidth availability. Um, so it is measurable. If I had, you know, if I could walk around with a functional MRI machine all the time, I could tell you definitely we have the capacity to measure people's bandwidth availability and usage through a functional MRI, but it's quite expensive um, and not very portable. So. Okay. Um, I think you kind of touched on this one, but as a team leader, how much can I really impact my team members' bandwidth? So hugely, I actually think it's easier to impact the bandwidth of the people that you um, supervise than it is to impact your own bandwidth um, because you're creating environments, you're creating prompts, you're creating conditions that other people respond in. And a lot of our bandwidth issues are about our mental response. We don't have direct control over all of that. Um, but you can create, as a supervisor, you can create an environment that's more or less bandwidth demanding um, and more or less bandwidth draining. Um, and so those are actually really big. Um, there's huge, you know, the, um, the beginning program we have for team leaders with mental bandwidth is, is also just touching on some of the basics. And then there's more in-depth programs that go into each of the strategies for how to help your team members to save their bandwidth or invest their bandwidth and the things that will lead to the best outcomes for everybody. Um, so it's huge. I actually prefer to talk to the people who um, have some say in the policies and the organizational um, you know, practices, because those are the ways that we can really, really efficiently help streamline bandwidth usage. Okay. Um, how does someone manage dealing with grieving while trying to maintain productivity at work? Yeah, I mean, that's such a big question. Um, clearly grieving or many of the other human processes that we go through are going to take up our bandwidth. If we have worries, if we have kind of the um, hopeless or, or um, sad thoughts that can come with grieving, um, that come along, the, those are going to use our bandwidth. Um, so, you know, on a practical level, as an individual, um, thinking about are we making time to move through some of that grief, whether that might be a support group or uh, a therapist or a spiritual advisor, 
or whatever um, works for you, but giving some time to the um, thoughts that come up is one of the ways to help reduce how intrusive they are when we're trying to do something else. Another piece, and I go into this a lot in the mental bandwidth basics session is thinking about the amount of judgment. So we, as you're experiencing those thoughts of grief, are you judging yourself for having those thoughts? Because the judgment's an extra layer of bandwidth demand on top of the grief. So if you can kind of have practice acceptance around the things that come up, we don't have control over our brains. Um, you know, like I'm saying, we have this tiny little bit that we can kind of control. Um, but you know, when our thoughts, our brain's job is to generate thoughts and we don't have to like engage with all of those thoughts. So you can like kind of let, if anyone's done meditation, you might've thought of the ticker tape kind of like, you can let the thoughts just go by without judgment. That's one way to reduce the amount of bandwidth that it uses. If you have the thought and you're like, oh, I need to stop having these thoughts because it's been long enough or I don't, it's not convenient for me to have this thought right now, that ac judgment actually adds a layer of bandwidth demand on top of it. So, you know, I, I hope that, you know, you're in a work situation where you can take some time um, to move through some of those things or take partial time off or something, that would be ideal. But I know that not everyone has that in their work in their work environment, so. Okay, last question. If we reduce bandwidth drains and make tasks easier, how does it translate to a benefit for my company? Is it getting more tasks done, doing better quality work, or being more creative? It's all of them, yay. Um, so yeah, there's, if we can reduce the amount of bandwidth demands and reduce the ways that bandwidth is drained, then people have more bandwidth available for all of the range of things. So that means, again, remember, think back to when I was talking about creating new habits or breaking old habits or being creative. It's all about those neural pathways and like, how are you connecting things in ways that haven't been done before? When people have more bandwidth available, then they're able to do more things with their conscious thoughts. So they're able to connect things ways that they hadn't before. So they become better problem solvers, better innovators. Um, they have more meaningful interactions with other people and they're less likely to um, react like in an angry or avoidant way and interpersonal interactions um, when they have more bandwidth available. Um, and when bandwidth demands are lower, people can accomplish more things. So if you can think about what a task might be like, um, you know, does this particular task need to be done in this particular way or can it be done in a variety of ways and any of them are acceptable and you can choose which one is the least bandwidth demanding for you. Um, then everyone kind of like I think about, um, you know, I work with college students that when they turn in their paper, am I asking them to worry about what format they turn it in is like what font or margins or citation format, like is that really the important part of that paper? Maybe it is, in which case that's something important for them to do, but maybe it's not. And maybe I would rather them focus on the content and not spend their bandwidth on the formatting um, so that I get the content that shows me that they understand the concepts from the class. So in the workplace, similarly, we can think about are there different ways or shapes of forms of doing something that might be less bandwidth demanding um, for for people so that they can uh, do more things and accomplish more more tasks that they want to get done and that are you know increase the productivity for the company and the person and their satisfaction as well great good good stuff tina looks like we great. really yeah really, really got some interesting questions from the participants yeah, definitely thank you yeah, but but that does conclude our time together we would like to thank you for attending and encourage you to register for Tina's upcoming programs coming up this fall on October 20th. We're, we'll be delivering the Mental Bandwidth Basics. And then on October 21st, we will be delivering the Mental Bandwidth Strategies for team leaders. The Mental, band, or mental, mental Bandwidth Basics is a pre prerequisite for the Bandwidth Strategies for team leaders. Um, those are able or they will be delivered via zoom and registration for those is now open at our website at www.kent.edu slash your training partner or you can give us a call at 330-672-3416 or uh, shoot us an email at your training partner at kent.edu
we can bring all of our programs to your organization virtually or in person and tailor them to fit your needs. You can join our extensive list of clients and bring Kent State to your organization. We also encourage you to register for our next webinar, which will be on Friday, June 15th, with we will be discussing never build a project schedule backwards with Kent State facilitator Bob Jewell and registration for that is now open on our website. Uh, during this webinar, we will discuss how to deal with unreasonable due dates that are imposed on projects, the three constraints associated with managing a project, and the three vital pieces of information you must know to have a successful project. For, <clears throat> for those attending live, you will be asked to complete a short survey. Please complete this short survey so that we can be sure we are bringing you the most usable and relevant content possible. You will also receive a follow-up email early next week with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development and our presenter, Dr. Tina Bargava, thank you for attending today and have a great weekend.